Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Boss, and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is streaming now on digital, and we are learning all of this movie's deep, dark secrets that we didn't catch in our initial breakdown in May. Some of it horrifying details that they left out of the movie, with little traces of these things left in it. Really, the more we learn about this movie, and the more we go back through it, the scarier and the cooler it gets. It's time we go back through this, literally frame by frame, to talk about this many more details that we didn't catch before, giving us a total of beep -bop, boop, Beep, boop, 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 beep, boop. Ding, 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 this total! There's so much in this movie! Let's break it all down in this video so everything is covered and you will be Sorcerer Supreme of the Mystical Details and Multiverse of Madness. The opening Marvel Studios title card alone has an insane amount of deeper layers of meaning that could be its own video. We're just gonna talk about it all here. By this point, you may have seen how it has been updated as usual to include the shot of Wanda's Scarlet Witch power up from WandaVision episode nine. The first time footage from a Disney Plus show has made its way into the title card. We also see Doctor Strange with the Time Stone magic, Strange fighting Thanos in Infinity War, making the same band arm pose that Defender Strange will do as a zombie in this movie. We see Wong in Endgame saying, you wanted more. Strange's last words to Tony in Endgame, holding up that one finger. Then the family team up shot from the WandaVision finale. We need to look closely at that. Also includes a nod to Sam Raimi's past film, Oz the Great and Powerful, The Wicked Witch of the West, being a very strong analog for Wanda in this film. Now the M and the A ultimately show Strange in the final shot as he's walking up the steps in the 2016 film. And Wanda when she nearly killed Thanos in Endgame, the most fearsome demonstration of her power in the Infinity Saga, but the E is Wong celebrating in the fighting ring from Shang-Chi. But most interesting of all these, on the surface before we see the family shot, they added a shot from Black Panther, tinted it purple, showing T'Challa and Shuri sharing their handshake and salute. Something that wouldn't be that big of a deal. All of these shots are just highlight reels from past films. But folks, I checked every other Marvel title from the past year. Multiverse of Madness is the only one so far to include this shot. They deliberately wanted to include include T'Challa and Shuri sharing a moment. Someone from Marvel Studios decided fans should really see these two together. I think it's a deliberate clue from the Marvel Studios team hinting that Shuri might possibly bear T'Challa's legacy in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. And finally, whereas in the past it's T'Challa's kinetic blast in the R that clears all the letters out, this time it is a sling ring portal that spreads outward, almost a way of sucking us into another realm of madness. This movie opens by diving into the Gap Junction, which 838 Christine Palmer later calls the space between universes. It may be based on the nexus of all realities in Marvel Comics, which is a similar concept, but here it is designed to look like the ruins of a church. Light pouring in through stained glass, 16 broken pathways leading to the altar of the Book of Vishanti, almost a way of showing how all these different realities are pathways leading to this one junction. But the fact that this is all destroyed is a reflection of the incursions that have taken a toll on the multiverse. Originally, this film was gonna open with a completely different scene, Mordo coming off of his too many sorcerers mission in the 2016 film post credit scene tracks Wanda down to her mountain cabin from the WandaVision post credit scene, but Wanda beheads Mordo, and she later presents his head to Strange, and according to screenwriter Mike Waldron, would even puppeteer his headless corpse. Actually, if you look to the Screen X poster for the film, we saw imagery in the corner of that poster showing this original opening scene. Of course, this was dark as hell, so it was removed, and this way they made Wanda's villainous turn more of a reveal. But in a way, the theatrical cut still opens with Wanda, because the first character we see on screen is the ribbon monster, which we later learn is Wanda's puppet. As it rages past us, in the opening frames, you can even see her runes already visible when he paused it at the right second. We actually learned the animators designed Gargantos with Elizabeth Olsen's features. And if you look at this monster too, from the way it roars at them, and even its opening grunt, all these things bear a bit of resemblance to Elizabeth Olsen's acting. They clearly used her as a visual and auditory reference. This whole monster is clearly designed to be a marionette with its cords tangled and it's super pissed off. Defender Strange and America Chavez flee this monster. Defender Strange freezes it. Little VFX details I appreciate here. It's tentacles that it used to clutch the piece of debris freeze and snap off. And that is what causes it to trip. Also, as Defender Strange does his backwards leap, he uses sorcery to guide his leap and cushion his landing. This spell is actually called the vaulting boots of Voltor. And we saw Mordo use these in the 2016 film. The difference, of course, is this Strange's magic is white compared to the orange color in 616. The opening words of this movie are in Spanish. Eso lo mató. No, 
It is the first MCU film to open with Spanish. America Chavez is the first openly LGBTQ plus Latinx female superhero. And her star emblazoned jacket has Amor es Amor stitched in along with a pride pin. Defender Strange was confirmed by Sam Raimi to be from Universe 617, which in the comics was formed when Spider Gwen from Earth 65 meets Gwen from 616 and prevents that Gwen from being thrown off the bridge by Green Goblin. And by doing that, diverges 616 Gwen into a timeline, 617, where she merges with Venom and becomes Spider Woman. They approach the Book of Vishanti, which in the comics is a book of positive counterspells. I like the color coding of it. The Darkhold is often colored with red sorcery. The Book of Vishanti emits a pure blue, the same color tone as America Chavez's Star Portals. A little hint that the spell contained within is contained within America herself. Defender Strange tells America, I'm so sorry. This is the only way. In the grand calculus of the multiverse, your sacrifice is worth more than your life. He quotes 616 Strange from Infinity War. There was no other way. And Strange from Spider-Man No Way Home. In the grand calculus of the multiverse, their sacrifice means infinitely more than their lives. I also love how this monster impales him with the killing blow precisely as he says the word life. Your sacrifice is worth more than your life. He cuts life short. The irony. America gets across to the Book of Ashanti, partly by American Ninja Warrioring on one of those monsters' ribbon arms, but that monster snares her, but does not kill her. Because remember, Wanda does not want America dead yet. But Strange cuts her free, and they both spiral through one of the star portals. And a little detail in the transition here, as that camera rotates from Defender Strange's corpse to an upside down shot of the 616 Strange waking up, the transition happens so that their faces are aligned. 616 Strange woke up precisely as Defender Strange died. Kind of like how when you die in a dream, that's the moment you wake up. Light streams into Strange's bedroom from curtains that cast some undulating shadows, evoking the arms of the ribbon monster attacking him moments before. This movie establishes the rule that whenever MCU characters have dreamed, they are peering into the lives of their alternate selves. This recalls Tony Stark's dream in Infinity War. Last night, I dreamt. We had a kid. So real. We named him after your eccentric uncle. Uh, what was his name? Right. Morgan. And Tony did end up having a daughter named Morgan. And the nightmares that Wanda gave the Avengers in Age of Ultron, including Tony's premonition of their deaths, because Tony even hinted at that in Endgame. I had a vision, I didn't want to believe it. I thought I was dreaming. Strange looks over at his wristwatch, the one Christine gave him and broke in the 2016 film, but he left that face broken, symbolizing the unhealable wound of his broken hands. But if you listen closely, it does still tick. And now if you look closely, you can actually see its date. It reads Tuesday, November 23rd. Now, November 23rd only falls on a Tuesday in the year 2021 in recent years or in the next few years. But in the MCU timeline, this is presumably November 2024, which might be why Disney Plus lists this between Eternals, which is in fall 2024, and Hawkeye, which is Christmas time 2024. However, of course, the events of Multiverse of Madness are definitely supposed to happen after Spider-Man No Way Home, which also ends sometime around Christmas 2024. Be a strange and Wong say in this movie. How much experience do you guys have with the multiverse? We have experience of the multiverse. Most recently, there was an incident with Spider-Man. And... <laughs> what man? Kevin Feige also said Multiverse of Madness was after No Way Home. And that allowed a spell to go wrong in Spider-Man No Way Home, which leads to the entire multiverse going quite mad in, in this. So how do we explain this? Well, the end universe answer is time is a flat circle. And in Loki Citadel at the end of all time, where the multiverse first fractured, the rules of causality were broken. But the real answer, folks, is that whoever makes the Disney Plus playlist and most of the people at Marvel Studios are just confused about their own chronology and they constantly screw it up, so let's move on. Strange uses magic to tie his necktie. Just a reminder that his injured hands are still somewhat clumsy. On his way through the Sanctum, he passes his piano. Remember in the Sanctum in the alternate post-incursion universe that he visits, the piano will be instrumental <laughs> in his music duel with Sinister Strange. Strange enters the church for the wedding. He passes these two boys who run to a mother who just bears a pretty strong resemblance to Elizabeth Olsen. I don't know if it was intentional, but it is a little echo of his coming conflict with a mother mother and her two elusive sons. Dr. Nick West returns to the 2016 film, revealing he dusted in the blip, and when he returned, he found he lost both his cats, oh, and also his brother. I guess what keeps me up at night is wondering, did it have to happen that way? Was there any other path? 
A line, of course, meant to guilt Strange for surrendering the Time Stone to Thanos, but also, if West is literally up at night, it means that he is losing sleep because he's dreaming of other lives where he still has his cats and his brother. The way that West knows what Strange did on Titan is likely due to Scott Lang's podcast series, Big Me, Little Me, on This Powered Life, revealed to be in the MCU in Ms. Marvel. One of many reasons you should absolutely watch that show because it is awesome. And yes, I know Scott Lang was not on Titan, but he knows the other Avengers. They told him and he told the public. Strange turns Christine's water into wine, quite Jesus-like, a running gag after he refilled Thor's beer in Ragnarok, which I will always say is the best use of magic. Steven regrets letting Christine go, but she says, It was never gonna work out between us. Why not? Because Steven, you have to be the one holding the knife. Yes, he has to be the one holding the knife. Strange being the scalpel holding surgeon, this knife imagery comes back throughout the film. And remember, this script was written by Michael Waldron and it parallels the love is a dagger monologue that he wrote for Loki. Love is a dagger. It's a weapon to be wielded far away or up close. You can see yourself in it. It's beautiful until it makes you bleed. But ultimately when you reach for it. It isn't real. Ultimately, Sylvie was the one left holding the dagger in that series. She cut Loki loose, as Strange does for Christine. When Strange goes out on the balcony to see the commotion, in the bottom right of frame is a billboard for Rogers the Musical, the Broadway show from Hawkeye. Billboards like these also showed up in No Way Home. He pulls out the red handkerchief stuffed in his pocket, revealing the cloak of levitation hidden in plain sight. And I love this maneuver because, like the alcohol-related tricks, this is practical. It really does feel like a classical magician illusion. And he changes wardrobe mid-air, similar to Tony Stark's famous free fall suit up in Avengers. Strange saves a woman and her baby by summoning a giant feline head. This is in front of a red storefront in McCloud's books, the 838 version of which shows up outside the 838 Sanctum, both named after Bob McCloud, longtime Marvel Comics artist. Strange decloaks the monster as Gargantos, who's a lesser known Namor villain. Originally, it's gonna be Shuma Gorath, but was renamed because Shuma Gorath is an HP Lovecraft invention licensed by Heroic Signatures, along with characters like Conan the Barbarian. Producer Richie Palmer revealed that they used a scan of Olsen's eye to create this eyeball and foreshadow the reveal of Wanda as the puppet master. You can see in its pain and its rage, its shock, the capillaries in the eyeball, this is all Wanda's emotion. And I love how Gargantos has these two gills beneath the eye. When he roars, the flaps open, making the sound of a jazz trumpet. <laughs> The bus that he throws at him has an ad for La Yave Coffee, Unlock a Better Day, a hint at Strange's upcoming quest to use a watch to unlock the back door as a key. Nearby is an ad for The Magic of Celestial Tea. And when Strange jumps on a taxi, there's a sign behind him for Stanley's, which I just think is a nod to Stan Lee, whose real name was Stanley Lieber. And in the 2008 Hulk movie, they paid tribute to him with Stanley's Pizza. Garganto scales the side of a building, Raimi calling back Doc Ock scaling the side of the building in 2004 Spider-Man 2. Screenwriter Michael Waldron cameos as the best man in the wedding party. Strange conjures these big hands to tear a lamppost out of the sidewalk, but notice they're scaly and they have four fingers each, making this a fantasy beast. I'm assuming the same feline that Strange used to catch the car. And he spears Gargantos' eye. And the skewered eyes visual is an homage to Raimi's flying eyeball in Evil Dead 2. They bring up Spider-Man. We have experience of the multiverse. Most recently, there was an incident with Spider-Man. Does he look like a spider? No, no, more like a man. Flying's wool, shoots webs. Yeah, bingo. Out of his butt? <laughs> Recalling the confusion over where exactly to wire Peter Parker's webbing comes out of him in No Way Home? Like, does it just come out of your wrists, or does it come out of anywhere else? Only, only the wrists. And again, just to clarify, despite the memory wipe spell in No Way Home, that spell only affects Strange and Wong knowing that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. They still know Spider-Man exists and have memories of Spider-Man joining them in their adventures. They've just had their memories wiped so they don't know who is under the mask. Like notice they never say the name Peter in the scene. They bury the corpse of the Defender Strange on the Sanctum roof, setting up a nifty plot device to call back in the third act. Just some nice economy of story there. And they recognize the runes as witchcraft. Do we know anyone who's faced such a thing? I think I might. <laughs> yeah, the music here is the WandaVision Bewitched theme composed by the Lopez's for the second episode.
We see the same house and kitchen from WandaVision's later episodes, and Billy and Tommy return wearing red and green to match their comic identities of Wiccan and Speed. They also have wristwatches matching their colors. There's a hamster cage on the countertop, the hamster named Max, or Maxi, short for Maximoff, probably to replace poor Sparky. Now, this bedroom tuck-in seems a bit surreal, and it's because they constructed it with footage shot on the WandaVision set, but it's been flipped. In WandaVision, episode nine, Billy's bed and the telescope were on the left, Tommy's bed, the skeleton decoration and the stop light were on the right, but here it is the opposite. But they did not flip the poster highest on the middle wall, they just slid it from right to left. They also added some house lights on the homes outside across the street. Actually, in the shot of Wanda looking over at Tommy, it is literally the same shot from WandaVision reversed. That is the same shot of Julian Hilliard, but they mapped in a new Elizabeth Olsen. From this, Wanda abruptly awakens, and within the same shot, the lighting and color tone shift from warm and golden to cold and gray tone, showing how her comforty dream fades into cold reality, a motif that we also see in Thor Love and Thunder with Gore, a desaturated villain mourning his family. Wanda clips some tree branches. Apples, right? Eventually. Yes, the trees are not yet bearing fruit, a metaphor for herself as her efforts to locate her sons have been fruitless. Apples, of course, also have been associated with the forbidden fruit of the Garden of Eden, where Eve was villainized for giving into evil, leading to the historic sexist view of women as more prone to evil. Of course, a poisoned apple, also the weapon of choice of the Witch Queen and Snow White, which also shows up later this movie, and pruning branches, the metaphor used by the TVA to tame the multiverse, as Wanda has been clipping or marking off universe that do not contain her sons. They chat. What do you know about the multiverse? The multiverse. This had his theories. He believed it was real and dangerous. And she drops the branches into this crate, a close-up showing its name Volkers. Now in the comics, Wendell Volker is an academic who, along with Reed Richards, discovers that Baron Zemo has traveled back in time. This is a 2007 Thunderbolts arc. But I think this crate close-up might have been from this scene originally having Wanda presenting Mordo's severed head to Strange here. Like, after the illusion faded, we might have returned to this crate, and from this, she pulls out the severed head. Strange says, We could use an Avenger. There are other Avengers. Yeah, but given the choice between the archer with the mohawk and several bug-themed crime fighters. Yes, referring to Hawkeye, and then Spider-Man, Ant-Man, and Wasp. If you think about it, also Scarlet Scarab just joined this club as well. Strange says helping them will get her back on the lunchbox, and there actually is an Avengers-themed retro lunchbox with Scarlet Witch on the side with Yellow Jacket and Daredevil. But after outing herself as knowing more than she should, she uses her red sorcery to warp this orchard into this burnt hellscape. The red sorcery warping these trees the same way the building storefronts do in Westview and WandaVision. We see that she is using the Darkhold, of course, the Book of the Damned, first introduced in WandaVision, and on the page is an eye visible at the center of it. This was the eye that she used to control Gargantos, and an eye that shows up in the runes on the walls of the Darkhold Temple, perhaps the eye of Cthon, whose horned head adorns the cover of this book. In the background is the burnt ruins of a structure where that large house was when the illusion was up. This is the house from the poster showing that removed opening scene with Mordo getting beheaded. Notice how Wanda has kept her hands in her pockets before showing her cards, and now we see the tips of her fingers have turned black from using the Darkhold, just as Agatha Wanda's hands had turned black when she possessed the Darkhold in WandaVision. Wanda's wardrobe has been updated, showing some scratches radiating from the heart region. You can see this better in the Kamartage battle, these scratches showing how her breaking of reality really stems from a broken heart. Also, the design of her collar leaves an opening in the shape of Vision's Mind Stone, the thing that she had to shatter in Infinity War and has never gotten over, blaming Strange because his surrender of the Time Stone is what specifically made that sacrifice pointless. Strange says, Wanda, your children aren't real. You created them using magic. That's what every mother does. It is such a good line read from Olsen here. And there's a little gesture here that's easy to miss. She flutters her eyelids. That's what every mother does. Yes, so she is clapping back here, but she's also showing how unstable she is. Back at Kamartaj, Wong explains. Scarlet Witch is a being of unfathomable magic. She can rewrite reality as she chooses, and is prophesied to either rule or annihilate the cosmos. Yes, he's recalling what Agatha read from the Darkhold. Your power exceeds that of the Sorcerer Supreme. It's your destiny to destroy the world. Wong, as Sorcerer Supreme, since Strange blipped, was probably pretty shook to learn this prophecy. Master Hamir returns in the 2016 film, and we meet Sarah, who's probably based on Wong's love interest, Sarah, in the comics, as well as Rintra, a green Minotaur sorcerer from Raval in the comics. Portals open from the Hong Kong and London sanctums, the backgrounds of those portals showing a Hong Kong street, and in London, a red phone booth and a double-decker bus. I assume Stephen Grant is writing it. The Camartage elders conjure a spell in the background, illuminating the floor. They are actually 
actually setting that mirror dimension trap that Wanda springs by stepping on later. Wanda's arrival mirrors that of the Wicked Witch of the West in the dark smoke over the Emerald City, demanding, surrender Dorothy! A girl who can transcend realities with shoes that pack a wallop, depending by a scarecrow who's falling apart, a heartless tin man, a lion who finds his courage, a good witch, who all seek help from the imposing men behind the curtain, who are actually phony liars, and ultimately realize there's no place like home. Because America realizes that Wanda just needs to go home. And when Wanda first appears, composer Danny Elfman stings it with this horror piano chord. He actually comes back to this for a scary moments with Wanda throughout the movie. As she tries to break in, Wanda identifies one weak sorcerer. Run. So cool. Whispering in the ear is exactly what Wanda does to each of the Avengers in Age of Ultron to corrupt them. And after she breaks in and wrecks the place, she telepathically whispers to America somewhere in the compound. Yeah, I love this. According to Disney Plus's closed captions, Wanda is whispering America in Sokovian, Wanda's native language. The more Sokovian she sounds, the more of a villainous she reverts to. Strange traps Wanda in the mirror dimension, which winds up like a toy music box. To get out of it, Wanda extends her hands into the broken mirror shards as if they are water, transfiguring herself into a piece of mirror so that she can exist in any reflective surface anywhere, similar to the logic of Gore's Shadow Realm in Thor Love and Thunder. If you haven't seen Love and Thunder yet, don't worry, it's not a spoiler. This was revealed in the trailer for the movie. The guard and Hamir get pulled into puddles, meaning Hamir is probably still stuck in the mirror dimension somewhere. They rush to cover the reflections, but Wanda pushes her contorted body out of a gong, looking like Samara in the ring, crossed with Pennywise and it. It's just terrifying. Wanda shows the countless universes where she is still with Billy and Tommy. Every night, the same dream, and every morning, the same nightmare. Yeah, again, she says Nightmare with a bit of a Russian slash Sokovian accent, Sokovian identity, rewinding her back to the Age of Ultron times when she was more of a villain. Strange unleashes serpents from his hands, an attack we actually saw Strange Supreme do in What If Episode 4. Notice how when Wanda slices their heads off, more grow in their place, kind of like a Hydra. Strange is literally fighting the Hydra era Wanda with a Hydra. Onto the multiverse montage, where they give us a movie called Multiverse of Madness, but limit the mad multiverse to like 11 seconds. These were all actually identified by the frame store VFX artists. First is the Living Tribunal statue world, originally going to be a giant temple or Indian statues, but they changed it to the Living Tribunal, who is the three-faced cosmic legal authority in the Marvel comics. But here, there are actually several of these heads. Then after a world with glowing particles sneaking up into a source, there is a cavern that they originally called the Onslaught Canyon world, originally going to be more like the Grand Canyon, like in No Way Home, but changed to be closer to the crevice in 127 hours. Then a mirror world, they went to be a glass world, but here they made it look more like ice, followed by a honeycomb world filled with giant bees. The next added an underwater coral reef, really just to mix it up. And then what they called an alt New York, where they had fish fly into the cars from the previous world. And on those taxis is an ad for Grindhouse Releasing, that's the film restoration company of Sam Raimi and the movie's editor, Bob Morosky. Then a pipe world with Tony Stark drones from Spider-Man Far From Home. You can see Stark stamped on all those drones and actually positioned exactly where the taxis were in the previous world. Then this hellish bone dimension, where some of the skeletons are larger than the others, if you notice. Like, there's one giant hand, like the one of the skeleton Thor does battle ropes with in Thor Love and Thunder. Notice how a lot of skeletons are climbing up, like trying to keep off of the floor of this world, like floor is lava. In Moon Knight, in the Duat, the goal was to keep off of the sand, because that would doom you to eternal damnation. That might be what's happening in Bone World here. Then one the artist called Savage World, where a T-Rex fights a Triceratops, a nod to the X-Men comic Savage Land. Then a comic book world, which they said was deliberately different from the animation style of What If. They focused more on the hard lines between the colors. Then there's this mysterious post-apocalyptic world, New York City in ruins, which they said was what the city would look like if the Avengers lost the Battle of New York. Then a cube world, which they said was very technical because they had to attach hair on each cube and they actually had to reduce the number of cubes, make them larger, because too many slices ended up being way too gory. Then the paint world that they refer to later, it's very hard to eat in here. Then Hydra world. This is New York stuck in the 1930s where Hydra took over because notice the Hydra logo on that blimp. I made a whole video explaining what this timeline could be and how it could bring Red Skull back for secret wars. Then a world with futuristic pyramids and Stonehenge-like configurations. Then this Blade Runner futuristic world. Then a more pristine futuristic cloud city. And then another hellish realm with lava rivers that Michael Waldron said was not Mustafar from Star Wars. And then they spit out in 838, where instead of lava rivers are waterfalls from the Empire State Building. 
building. There's greenery covering all the buildings and overhead some rainbow covered clouds. You'll notice many of the pedestrians carry umbrellas. Maybe these clouds are on an artificial clockwork to water all the plant life and people carry the umbrellas to brace for it. All these people also wear neutral colors, maybe as a fashion trend to keep the eyes on colorful splendor of nature instead of what we wear. In addition to going on red and stopping on green, the taxis that drive on these streets are blue, the color of Reed Richards. If you pause the taxis that passes behind Pizza Papa's cart and they're marked with three credits per mile, suggesting that Reed Richards and the other geniuses of this universe helped put currency on an international standard, but still don't use the metric system, which makes no sense. And they made Pizza Papa a cameo by the great Bruce Campbell, longtime collaborator with Sam Raimi from Evil Dead films and the Spider-Man trilogy. Strange leaves them in a spell, punching himself for weeks until it finally fades in the post credit scene. Actually there in that scene on his cart, you can see a fork. This is the same fork that the tiny Ashes used on Ash's butt in Army of Darkness. America's memory lane flashback shows the utopian parallel from the comics, but a bee lands on her finger, causing her to freak out and open portals to suck her moms to hell. Honeycomb world must have sucked for her. The 838 Sanctum statue of Stephen Strange says he gave his life defeating Thanos and calls him Earth's mightiest hero, the Avengers moniker. I also love how the statue was built out in the streets so all the cars have to drive around it and look at it. The way that in Washington DC, you have to drive in a roundabout to look up at the Iwo Jima statue. Mordo explains dreamwalking and Raimi and Bob Borowski edit this sequence with superimposed crossfades, Elfman's moody rock music, just giving this movie a 90s witchcraft vibe, like something from The Craft or Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I don't care what the haters on Twitter say. The imagery of this movie rocks, but Mordo drugs them with the sands of Nisanti, a spell from the comics that prevents the usage of magic for three minutes. 616 Wanda dreamwalks into alternate Wanda, her presence peeking out from behind the stairs and then hiding again. Voyeuristic imagery akin to John Carpenter's Michael Myers point of view shots at the beginning of Halloween. Actually, if you listen closely here, notice what Wanda tells the boys. That is exactly what Wanda does to herself. She turns her own boys against her. On the TV, they're watching a black and white cartoon of Oswald and Hortensia. This is a 1928 Walt Disney short called The Sky Scrappers. Walt made these Oswald shorts for Universal before a contract dispute led him to launching Mickey Mouse and Steamboat Willie. Oswald, meanwhile, has gained a bit of a cult following as the Mickey Mouse who might have been a what if poster hero in this what if universe. Notice how there are no photos of visions around this home. That is because according to Elizabeth Olsen, these alternate reality Wandas are single mothers divorced from vision. All the lights flashing, the wind blowing, the photo turning to look at Wanda despite being frozen in time. All this horror imagery evokes Sam Raimi's effects in movies like Drag Me to Hell. The food rolls around on the plate like in Poltergeist. The tea crashes like an ocean, an ocean flooded the post-incursion universe that we visit later this movie, making this an early sign of how these are all leading to incursions. But after all the noise, I just love how they show the possession finally completing with a simple silent gesture. <laughs> Yes, breaking the fourth wall, looking at us, like the final unnerving shots of Psycho and Paranormal Activity. Sarah stabs the 616 Darkhold, burning herself alive, the last part of her turning to ash being her eye, releasing a single tear. But notice her lips here. She is mouthing something as her final words to Wong, and it looks like she is saying the words, I love you. This severs Wanda's dreamwalk link. <laughs> And again, the lack of sound on the intercutting just makes it so haunting. This is how Wanda would see it, just images from her dream flickering away from her. And Wanda is left with her hands in the air just as she was in WandaVision when Vision faded away from her. Wong takes her to Mount Wundagor, where in the comics, the demon Elder God Kithon inscribed the spells that were eventually drafted into the Darkhold book. This is also the mountain where in some comics, Wanda and Pietro were born in the castle of the High Evolutionary, nursed by Bova. This is also where Kithon initially cursed Wanda when she was a baby. Though in the 616 MCU, she was born to Irina and Oleg Maximoff in Sokovia. Also in WandaVision, Wanda showed us she already had some low level probability hex abilities as a girl. It just remains to be seen if the MCU will trace that back to Cathan's curse. The temple walls are carved to look exactly like the Scarlet Witch page of the Darkhold scene in WandaVision. A set photo actually showed how one of these statues shows Billy's Wiccan form, suggesting that those boys were part of the Scarlet Witch prophecy. This temple's guards are the Engari. These are Cathan's Elder Spawn minions from the comics, and Wanda realizes the chamber is not a tomb but a throne. The altar she stands on has that same horned head as the Darkhold book cover, perhaps being the horned form of Cathan from the comics. Meanwhile, Christine explains, Our universe is 838, 
and we've designated yours 616. Yes, with this line, the MCU formally codifies its numerical designation as 616, which is the main universe in the comics. This number was coined by Captain Britain comics writer David Thorpe, who said in an interview that he got that number by subtracting the round number 50 from 666. So you know who is behind all of this! 616 universe first showed up in the MCU on Selvig's chalkboard in Thor The Dark World. It was mentioned by Mysterio in Far From Home, though in that case must have been a lucky coincidence since, you know, he was a liar making it all up. 616 also showed up on Scott Lang's storage locker in Endgame and on the film strip, referring to the MCU timeline in Loki Episode 1. Now, some comics fans, including Ms. Marvel star Iman Vellani, are very frustrated with this reveal since many comics readers previously understood the film universe to exist alongside the comics universe, like the comics have referenced events in the film's universe. But as Kevin Feige has said, the MCU has always been meant to be an adaptation of the comics, not something that exists in a multiverse alongside them. Similar to how Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, in that animated film they refer to 616, 1610, etc. That's all an adaptation of the numerical designations in the comics. It's not meant to replace them or erase them. Christine says she works for the Baxter Foundation, named after the Baxter Building, the headquarters of the Fantastic Four. She brings up a radiograph of his broken hand, suggesting Strange's hand injury is his constant across universes, the way with great power is a constant for Peter Parker's. Strange's cell is labeled D23, a Disney Easter egg, 1923 being the year Walt founded his studio in the name of the annual conference. Also, Bucky's cell was D23 in Civil War. Strange asks if their shield or Hydra, but Mordo confirms, The Illuminati will see you now. The Illuminati? Yes, the Illuminati in the comics is a six-member panel representing the various corners of the Marvel world. Tony Stark, Doctor Strange, Charles Xavier, Reed Richards, Black Bolt, and Namor. Originally, Black Panther was invited, but he said, ah, oh, nah, no, F that, I don't want to be in it. The Baxter security is Ultron Sentries, voiced by actor Ross Marquand, who voiced Ultron in What If and Red Skull in Infinity War. These sentries looking this way imply that in 838, Ultron must have successfully taken over the same way he did in Age of Ultron and duplicated himself to make these like he did in the Age of Ultron events, but that the Marvel heroes must have prevailed in subduing Ultron, probably because they had help from the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. So there probably is a Tony Stark somewhere in this universe. You'll notice this facility is in Central Park, and the interior is modeled on the lobby of the British Museum in London. Of the many statues that adorn it, the tall female warrior is actually modeled on Xena Warrior Princess, according to Sam Raimi. Strange meets this movie's Illuminati. Mordo introduces himself as Baron Carl Mordo, his name from the comics. Haley Atwell returns as Captain Carter, her costume and shield looking like it does in What If? First Avenger. The music is actually a version of the Captain America theme. Anson Mount returns from the short-lived Inhuman series as Black Bolt, King of the Inhumans. Lashana Lynch as Captain Marvel, apparently having swapped missions with Carol Danvers. And of course, and the smartest man alive, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. Yes, the producers actually said they included a deliberate Doctor Doom nod here with the portal he arrives through. This is Doom's time platform from the comics. So yeah, somewhere in 838, there is a Victor Von Doom. Strange asks, didn't you guys chart in the 60s? I'm sorry. A nod to the Avengers being compared to the Beatles many times in the MCU, and a callback to Strange's expertise in music history from the 2016 film. Also, the Fantastic Four historically are considered to be 60s era heroes. It's actually been theorized that they might have existed in 616 in the 1960s, contemporaries of a younger Hank Pym. Reed explains, The larger the footprint you leave behind, the greater the risk of an incursion. An incursion occurs when the boundary between two universes erodes and they collide, destroying one or both. This explanation comes directly from John Hickman and Steve Epstein's 2013 New Avengers run when Black Panther reassembles the Illuminati to deal with an incursion between universes. This storyline leads eventually to the 2015 Secret Wars crossover, which is probably where the MCU is headed. Then the sixth member joins. We should tell him the truth. Our final member. Professor Charles Xavier. Patrick Stewart returns from the X-Men films, but in a yellow hover chair, green suit, and blue and black striped tie from the animated series. The music here is Ron Wasserman's theme from the 90s show. Now, there is a seventh chair empty, and it has been confirmed to not belong to the 838 Strange, according to interviews with the screenwriter who said that it was a mystery above his pay grade for something Marvel has in the works ahead. So I am guessing it's either a variant Black Panther or more likely Namor, because Namor is expected to arrive in Wakanda forever. Charles uses telepathy 
Empathy to flash back to the 838 Infinity War event, notice his brain waves look just like the Echo waves from the 90s series whenever he uses his psionic powers, and we see Titan Thanos dead with a splintered Uru blade in his chest and an Infinity Gauntlet with no Mind Stone and no Time Stone. No Mind Stone means Vision is alive in 838. And also notice the seven pointed ships are still standing upright. So this battle never escalated to Thanos spiking a moon at this planet the way he does in Infinity War. They were able to make short work of him much faster. 838 Steven's fingertips are black as Wanda's and Agatha's were. I mean, this guy was dipping in the dark cold. But on his chest is an interesting icon that our buddy MT pointed out may be an Oni, a demon from Japanese mythology. So no matter what, this strange is into some interesting stuff. Black Bolt executes him. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, they recorded Mount saying, I'm sorry, several times different ways, successively louder into a shout. So each echo reflects deeper and deeper heartbreak. Also, in that audio mix, you can hear Strange's final pained scream, a scream that stays with them after the blast is done. Also notice how that sonic blast cross dissolves back into 616 Strange hearing the story in the present. It's just a very cool way of showing how the curse of that past Steven echoes through the multiverse into this Steven and why they fear him so much. Alarms go off and in the Sentry security feed, you see Wanda severing many of them at the midsection, and the last one she chokes by its throat and peers into its eyes before just pulling its head off. Charles says, Just because someone stumbles and loses their way doesn't mean they're lost forever. Yes, a direct quote from 2014's Days of Future Past. Just because someone stumbles, loses their way, it doesn't mean they're lost forever. Now, Wanda is covered in the oil from the Ultron sentries, reminding us of when she yanked out Ultron's heart in Age of Ultron and oil poured out of it like blood. It's smeared on her face the same way pig blood is smeared on Sissy Spacek and Carrie, and she unleashes hell just like Carrie does. Reed tries to talk her down. I have children of my own. I understand your pain. Is their mother still alive? Yes. Good. There will be someone left to raise them. Reed was referring to his wife, Sue Storm, the Invisible Woman, and their children, Franklin Richards and Valeria Richards. Black Bolt inhales, ready to strike, but one is ready for him. What mouth? <laughs> I am obsessed with this because it is the most violent close-up we've ever seen in the MCU, so let's go through it. First, Wanda erases his mouth like Neo in the Matrix, which is panic-inducing enough. Just the thought of that causes Black Bolt to make the worst mistake of his life, screaming, making him the one member of the Illuminati other than Mordo, whom Wanda does not kill. He takes his own life. His eyes bulge out, then there's a glow in his jaw from his sonic blast ping-ponging around his mouth, then blood spurts out of his nose, his skull pops, and then his eyes bleed after that point, his brains oozing in his mask, and his tuning fork flickers out. Then Wanda shreds Reed into string cheese. Actually, if you look closely on that overhead shot as he screams, each strand of his body, she is twisting it, inducing as much pain as possible. Maria and Peggy fight back. Peggy quotes Steve's line. Haven't you read enough? I could do this all day. I could do this all day. But Wanda redirects Peggy's own shield back at her, severing her at the waist. When the shield wedges in the foreground, blood drips from it. And although Peggy is out of focus in the background, go frame by frame and you can see the top half of her body does slide off of her legs. While Maria's death is the least visceral, it's still pretty insulting. Wanda collapses that Xena statue so that Xena's face is crushing Maria, delivering a kiss of death. Mordo uses his vaulting boots of Altor against Strange in their duel, but Strange cuffs him with the Sansa Nisanti cuff at the last second to de power the magic blade right before it hits his face. Down in the trench, Mordo kicks at his head, and actually in that shot of the boot coming in at Strange's face, Sam Raimi revealed it is actually a fake leg on a broom. Charles enters Wanda's mind, trying to stop her. It's seen as this awesome white void with just bits of rubble, representing her bombed Sokovian home that we saw in WandaVision. On a TV set shows WandaVision Episode 1, the way the Dick Van Dyke show played on the TV when Wanda and Pietro's home got bombed in Episode 8. We hear an air raid siren blaring. That's the sound to signal a bomb dropping for one of the anxiety was the Stark warhead falling in her home, forever blinking but never going off. For Charles, the anxiety is Wanda finally catching up to him in this mind. That red smoke billows up behind him and... Ah! 
It gets me every time. It's even scarier now when you can pause it. Because first off, the Scarlet Witch has a freaking demon face, like the demon face that pops up for a few frames throughout The Exorcist. I mean, I'm sorry to remind you of that, but it reminds me of that. Also, you may have seen, she does not just snap his neck. She grabs the lower half of his face and the upper half of his face and seems to rip it in half. The lower half of his face just becomes more red smoke. Actually, during the sequence, originally Hope Van Dyne Wasp was drafted to appear as part of this Illuminati with Hope shrunken down flying toward Wanda and the screenwriter Michael Waldron said that Wanda was going to clap her hands to squash her. Strange's wristwatch is a key to open the door to the gap junction. Wanda grabs America from behind and repulses Strange's attack to incinerate the Book of Ashanti. For a moment, the page is open to show a star. Now remember, since Strange has photographic memory, he could read that whole page in an instant and know from that star that America's innate power could defeat the Scarlet Witch is inside her and remember that, which is how he knows how to motivate her with that speech in the final battle. As Wanda holds the star portal open. Between the portal layers, you can actually see some different terrains flickering in and out. That just shows how these alternate universes flash through chaotically. America gets captured in the temple. The altar she lies on is in the shape of, what is it kids? Hexagon! Like Wanda's hex in Westview, of course. Strange and Christine get stranded in a post-incursion universe, entering through the same alleyway that Strange arrived into 838. One new universe in Act 2, another new universe in Act 3. Now presumably, this is actually the universe that 838 Strange annihilated by dreamwalking into Sinister Strange. The buildings are melting into inky strands, looking a lot like the visuals in What If Episode 4. The cars actually include a mix of different eras. There's some old-timey buggies, but also a yellow Delta 88, the car that Sam Raimi puts in all of his movies from Evil Dead to Uncle Ben's car in Spider-Man. The land in front of the Sanctum is covered in bones and skulls, meaning that Sinister Strange allowed people to gather in front of his Sanctum, begging for him to save them, and he watched as they all died. And on the other side of the Sanctum is a looming red crescent in the Hickman comic the sign of an incursion was the alternate universe depicted as a giant red planet in the horizon. Inside, Strange meets Sinister Strange, telling him, We had a sister, Donna. She died when we were kids. We were playing on a frozen lake. And she fell through the ice. I couldn't save her. Now in the comics, Strange's sister Donna died while swimming in a pool. But if you think about it, wanting to save a girl crashing through ice motivates why Strange wants to save America Chavez so bad. Her portals are designed to look like ice, cracking ice through which she drowns. For Strange, America represents the sister Donna whom he lost through the ice. Sinister Strange opens a third eye on his forehead. Strange sometimes has a third eye in the comics as a manifestation of the eye of Agamotto. And it is the mystical sight that the Ancient One referred to when she touched this spot on his head. Open your eyes. But here, the eye represents the twisted evil of the Darkhold, the eye of Cthon that we saw on the page and on the wall of the temple, an eye that lives on at the end of this movie. As they duel with each other, the magic is in these competing color tones. 616 Strange with orange, Sinister Strange with purple, the same color as Agatha's dark sorcery, which may come from the Dark Dimension with Dormammu. In an amazing sequence actually inspired by Danny Elfman, thinking that Sam Raimi would shoot it down, they weaponize music and it rules! <laughs> Yes, the piano chord that previously represented Strange's fear of Wanda, because we heard this discordant note every time we were creeped out by her. Strange instead shows his mastery of this fear by weaponizing the music to combat the evil. One specific note, dart cuts through the strap around the dark hold, and then Sinister Strange defends himself by creating a measure to contain all these notes. <laughs> I like how as he conjures that measure, it makes a sound of horns. Every move of this battle uses a different part of the orchestra. And you probably caught in there, that was the famous riff of Johann Sebastian Bach. But then this leads to a volley between the two of them. <laughs> Yes, in there was Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5, and then the final percussions used the snare drum. Strange defeats Sinister Strange by using another musical instrument in the scene that Sinister Strange didn't notice, the harp. Just one little note to explode all the other notes, blasting Sinister Strange out the window, impaling him like Saruman in Return of the King. Strange flips to a dark old page to one illuminating these crimson skeletons, representing the souls of the damned that he will use to dreamwalk into Defender Strange's corpse. The way he rises from the dead is full Sam Raimi 
Evil Dead, and I love it. The shot of Manhattan from the 616 rooftop actually keeps the Met Life Building, which in the MCU has been where Avengers Tower is normally located, but it really just seems like Phase 4 titles these days for now have given up placing Avengers Tower in the New York skyline. Now, one of the Souls of the Damned is a vocal cameo by the movie's producer, Richie Palmer. We see Strange being dragged under, and we learn later this does have lasting consequences in the final shot of the film. The souls spill over into the Incursion universe, but Strange is able to vanquish them. Where's your bomb alive? Go back to hell. Yes, this is the same artifact Strange tried to use on Kaecilius in the 2016 film. You don't know how to use that, do you? Uh... That is why Kaecilius was a little nervous there. This thing could have banished him to hell. And yes, it is important that Strange says hell here. I'll explain why later. Christine tells Strange, They're spirits. Use them. Yes, in addition to Defender Strange's corpse just being really smart economy of story, we were wondering why he was cloakless in the opening scene, but this serves a function as well. Because logically, Mount Wendigore must be off limits to sorcerers, otherwise they'd be there all the time trying to destroy it. One requires evil Darkhold sorcery to access it, so it gives us this awesome opportunity to turn the souls of the damned into a cloak of levitation. And yes, I love how Danny Elfman shreds on electric guitar here, setting up the guitar we hear in the final shot of the film when Strange suffers the consequences of this unholy pairing. Wong stabs the big Ngar eye with his kunai, the same weapon Gargantos blocked earlier when its Wanda eye was solely focused on him, but now that Wanda's eye is on Strange and she assumes Wong is dead, he's able to hit the bullseye. Defender Strange spreads his cloak. <laughs> Yes, the damned voices cackle and cheer with glee, which at first comes off like they're just loving being part of this. But if you think about it, they're actually celebrating their claiming of Strange's soul. Wanda shouts, Dreamwalking, you hypocrite. Yeah, just like Hycelia shouted at the Ancient One for using dark dimension magic in the 2016 film. Hypocrite! Strange finds himself in the same moral quandary that Defender Strange was in before. And I love how this realization happens as he is in the body of that asshole. We think he's gonna go through a sacrifice in America. America's even okay with it. But instead he says, Every time you opened a portal, you sent us exactly where we needed to go. And we realize what makes this Strange different from Defender Strange is that this 616 Strange went through something the others did not, an Infinity War conflict in which he lost. He had to look at 14,605,000 futures and he found the one correct path, the path that led him to where he is now and a path that still extends forward. So unlike 838 Strange, who always felt FOMO seeking a better life and corrupted his soul and killed trillions with the Darkhold to do this, 616 Strange, after meeting Sinister Strange, has seen the dark path that leads to. So this guy has instead learned to trust his current path, regardless of the guilt he feels for being on it and the sacrifices he's made to walk it. So he empowers America to punch the hell out of Wanda. Her star portals again show a variety of landscapes, but her second hit closed them off to only one, the lava river hell that we saw before. The fact that we see it twice in this movie suggests that this is a key realm in the MCU, where the souls of the damned originate, where Cathan may reside, and probably the dominion of this a-hole. But America changes her tactic. I can't beat you. I'll give you what you want. And she punches Wanda into her living room with her sons, letting them see her for who she is. You'll notice the way they see her choking America is the same pose Thanos choked Wanda with in Infinity War. Also notice on the TV is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Disney's first animated feature length film, a contrast to the Oswald short that previously played on this TV. And this movie's villain is an evil witch, making Wanda especially scary to these boys. Before she told them, don't make mom out to be the bad guy. And that's exactly what she's done to herself. And these boys defend and their mom. Stop it! Yeah, Elizabeth Olsen said that these boys threw something that hit her in the face and her stop it was genuine anger, which she used as an actor to scare the crap out of these kids and that she felt really bad about it. She tries to explain. I would never hurt you. Never. I would never hurt anyone. I'm not a monster. I'm a... But this time, Wanda cannot bring herself to say that she is a mother. Yet, 838 Wanda forgives her. No, could go be loved. 
and Wanda finally seeing the arrow of her ways destroys the temple. But as it falls, there is a burst of red magic that might be her transporting to a new universe or escaping into a pocket reality. Either way, I'm pretty confident Wanda will return at some point. America and Wong portal to rescue Stranger Christine from the Incursion Sanctum from a mountaintop, which some are calling a continuity error since we saw America and Wong escape back to Kamartage from the temple. But to be fair, America had no idea where Strange and Christine were banished to. So she and Wong may have been portaling around to a ton of places and universes looking for Strange. And then they went back to the scene of the crime and maybe were able to figure out from there, oh, there's an Incursion universe where they must be now. I don't know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's okay. America stays behind as a sorcerer in training at Kamartage and Strange gives Wong the respectful bow that Strange had previously denied the Sorcerer Supreme. Strange fixes the broken watch face, the camera lens buried behind the whirring gears, going from a cracked face to the watch to clarity. But rather than wearing it, notice he tucks it away in a drawer, which is where he first lifted this wristwatch from in the 2016 film, back when he had a ton of watches, representing his interest in a lot of ladies. The fact that he puts it away now, fixed, shows how he has finally moved on from Christine. His morning stroll turns into a nightmare. <sighs> <sighs> Wong did warn him about this. How are you feeling? Why do you ask? You used the dark code to dreamwalk into your own corpse. Oh, yeah, right, that. The screenwriter said that they considered an alternate ending, which would have made the context of this a bit clearer, in which we would have seen the 616 Strange trapped in the Incursion universe, as back in 616, Sinister Strange of the Third Eye turns to camera and smiles as we hear a Vincent Price laugh like the final shot of Thriller. The idea was 616 Strange and Sinister Strange have swapped places. And while that is not obvious here, that seems to at least be the subtext. The Third Eye means that Strange has a lingering attachment to the souls of the damned. These souls were shared in a 616 universe, and they spilled over into the post incursion universe. They are not specific to any one reality, but rather they come from one single realm that is shared among all of these universes. And that realm, in Christine's own words, is hell. Therefore, despite the Darkhold's destruction, Strange's soul remains an open gateway, allowing Sinister Strange to dreamwalk into his body here. So when Clea appears in the post credit scene to take this three-eyed Strange to the Dark Dimension to deal with an incursion, this is not a team-up of heroes, my friends, but a team-up of sinister forces. That is all the new stuff I spotted in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EAVoss. Follow New Rockstar. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. <laughs>